We've been talking about having a voice, um, having representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to parliaments and governments for a very, very long time. You go back through the history, you talk, look at some of the old leaders, William Cooper, you look at some of the great big movements um, that our country has seen from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples has been very much focused on this issue of, of, of genuine representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our voices. Um, on the issues that impact our lives and communities. So this is a very, very old story. But we saw more recently in 2017, the release of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the invitation from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to the broader Australian community saying, um, yes, we want to be recognised in the Australian constitution and we want that recognition to be meaningful, we want it to be practical, we want it to be through a voice. Yeah, it was really powerful from my community when we saw the Uluru Statement come out, I was still young. <laughs> um, so it was, it was really powerful to see some of those signatures and members of our own community who participated in Uluru, who talked about what it meant for us and our families um, and coming back and hearing directly from them and, and hearing about how this isn't just about, you know, this is such a big movement, a big piece, a big, an ask, um, that's quite simple, but it has huge effect for us at a local level, at, you know, but it's a massive opportunity for us to create some significant change and impact our families and our communities. It's a very simple concept. It's about getting the advice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples front and centre um, with parliaments and governments. And the reason why we need that advice there is because our people on the ground understand how these issues such as health, education, housing and jobs, how it actually works on the ground. They understand the challenges. So the voice is about bringing that expertise, bringing that wisdom to the table to advise parliaments and governments about making sure that we're getting these issues right. We're frustrated that we haven't achieved the level of progress at the pace we want to see for our families and communities. So the voice is absolutely that foundation that real change in families and communities across the country. I come from Cairns, right? I come from far north Queensland and it's such a stark contrast to come from a community like that and know that how do we talk about our solutions and who do we talk to? Because we spend quite a significant amount of time providing upskilling to our members of parliament who don't understand the complexity of our, our culture, the complexity of our communities, the complexity of our solutions. And the voice is about really us having a space that we can go to, that where our solutions have the opportunity to be heard. Where our solutions at a grassroots level for our communities have the opportunity to impact laws and policies before they are made about us. Um, that's, it's the before part and we need the opportunity to be able to shift them before they come. I think it'll do two things. I think it will put a fundamental truth into our constitution, which is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first peoples of this land. And we haven't had that before. And that's really so important for how we understand our history and our future. And then the second thing I think it will do is create more participation about how we make laws and policies that work for people. And I reckon the more participation in democracy and in public policy, the better. I like that. Oxfam has a really proud history of working alongside of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So going back to our predecessor organisation, Community Aid Abroad, 
we've been working alongside of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for about 50 years. So we were there working with people to help set up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander controlled organisations. We helped set up the Closing the Gap campaign and we've run programs like Straight Talk, which was helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women to understand the political system and to become, step into the role of political leaders in their communities. So for us, when the Uluru Statement from the Heart invited Australians to walk with First Peoples on this journey towards justice, it was a really straightforward proposition for us. We thought, yes, this is the next important step to take. And now the voice proposition is presented to the Australian people. We really back that and we, we stand by and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So for our work, we're known for our international work as a development organisation, but we've also got this really long and proud history of working in Australia with First Peoples. For us, addressing poverty and inequality and working on justice issues overseas has to be complemented with working on those issues in Australia with First Peoples. I was actually a participant of one of Oxfam's programs um, from back in the days and it was actually one of the trigger points for, for me personally about me stepping into a whole other phase of, of the work and supporting our own community and giving me some skill sets to feel really confident to be able to keep um, progressing and, and doing a whole body of work around setting up our own organisation and, and those kinds of things. So um, really, really powerful. Um, I think that Oxfam is stepping into this space and alongside us and hearing our voices, it's been awesome. We're talking about some of the, some of the largest not-for-profit organisations all the way down through to small um, faith-based, uh, multicultural-based sporting bodies um, from across the country that are getting behind and saying very strongly um, that they are supporting the yes vote in the referendum later on this year. So um, the support from Oxfam is fantastic and it, and it runs alongside a growing movement of organisations and people from our communities across the country getting in behind yes. We hear this a lot about, you know, grassroots mob. It's, and how will it affect us? We have such beautiful capabilities and solutions and ideas that address our own issues from mob that live and breathe it every day on the ground. And I know this because I've lived and breathed it, right? As an organisation for the work that I do, we've supported grassroots community members who were volunteering and addressing suicide, they were addressing the health inequalities out of their own pocket because our mob know what needs to happen, they know what needs to change and they have the skill sets and the capabilities to do it. The problem often is it's the system and the shift that, that is continually clashing and for us we need to be able to, to have our voices heard but for it to be valued. I think we've been through a whole experience where, where grassroots communities and, and mob on the ground have not had the opportunities to truly um, express what those solutions are and to be able to give information and provide advice to the parliament around the policies that they make. And we know that we can then start to shift these, these real inequalities because we will feel empowered. We will feel empowered to know that we have a mechanism that gives us the capacity to create the change that we need to see, right, on our issues. That for me is fundamental. It's, it's mob being able to go and stand up and address our own issues for our, our way, you know, self-determine that. Well, I was recently travelling through the Kimberleys talking to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people there, the communities there. Um, and it struck me that um, a lot of what they were talking about, the challenges that they had being having their voices heard and being involved in the decisions that affect their lives, far too often they're dealing with the symptoms of some of the challenges. Far too often when they talk about, and there was one community in particular that talked about some of the challenges facing their young people, um, being disengaged, being out in the streets, getting into a bit of trouble community were concerned about their young people but they were saying actually this is actually that is a symptom of a lack of housing mm. secure and safe housing in the community because 
Um, there wasn't enough there. There wasn't enough spaces for families to be. And as a result of that, young people were not being in homes and they weren't being out in the streets. Um, so understanding the complexity of the actual challenges themselves and not just constantly putting out fires on the symptomatic front, mm. but looking at the real issues that were in the communities. And, and if we start genuinely listening to the voices of those people, we are going to start to see more sustainable, longer-term effective solutions. And everybody wants to see that. Everybody knows that what we're doing at the moment, despite all the best intentions, considerable investment, it's not working. It's not working well enough. So the voice is that foundation for those those experts on the ground to really sit down and talk through the complexities, to get to the root of the problem and say, look, this is, this is how we actually start to address these issues over the long term. It's not going to happen overnight. There is no silver bullet. There's no quick fix. But the foundation is absolutely involving the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the decisions that affect their lives. I don't know as a non-Indigenous person. So my job here is to listen and, and to learn from what you're saying and paying attention. And that's, that's the point of the voice, I guess, is for non-Indigenous people and for government and people in decision-making roles to listen and to hear what people in grassroots communities are saying they need. I think we know overwhelmingly the polling has told us that First Nations people um, as a majority support what the voice means and, and what it, this reform. But we know that even more so when we're on the ground and we're having the conversations. Um, I go out in my community and we have really a, um, awesome conversations with First Nations mob about um, what it means, um, what role we will play as First Nations people and how we want that to look. Um, and I think that's really powerful is that the majority of people that even I'm speaking to on a day-to-day -day basis is um, supportive of, of this change. So over the last six and a half years since the Uluru Statement from the Heart was created, we've known that there's about 80% or even a little bit more than 80% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that would get in behind and vote yes for the referendum. So there is very, very strong support out there. That said, we've also got to acknowledge that there are different views on this issue and there are some people that, that do take a different view. And I'll, I want everybody to know that that's okay. It's actually okay that amongst ourselves, amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, we do have different views. And that's, okay. and that's actually a sign of a healthy community. We, you'd expect that on an issue this big. We're never going to get 100% on any singular issue. But I say to many of our supporters and many of our allies out there, understand that in supporting a yes vote in the referendum, you're standing alongside thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that really want to see a successful referendum, that want to see constitutional recognition through the voice to parliament. by Rod Goodman, Oxfam Australia, West Melbourne, NAM.